Hey everyone, it's Weekender time again, and you'll want to watch the show because we've got a class interview with Matt Hart from Steamford Games, all about Dark Souls. Oh, that game. Uh, oh, no, yes. That game. <laughs> and we've got some cool Protoss prizes as well. Watch the show and find out what they are. From Viking halls to the cities of the future, terrain buffs will love our foreground hub. Watch gaming tables of all genres come to life at beastsofwar.com. It's time for 28mm World War II action. Will you recreate history or reshape it your way? On the Bolt Action Hub at beastsofwar.com. Hey everyone, welcome to another Weekender. Oh my goodness. It's been a roasting week here in the UK. Yeah. Far too hot. The sweat's been dripping off me. I've tried to play board games <laughs> and the tiles have been going flying. The minis have been dropping out of my hands. Uh, <laughs> I've been lashing with sweat. It's just poof, terrible. So, uh, by, by roasting, you mean we're hitting the low 20s, yeah? Yeah, low 20s. Yeah, I, I'm sure Ruskin <laughs> is probably sitting there in Florida going, gents, you don't know the meaning of heat. Come out here. You'll be swimming in your trunks. Yeah. <laughs> we're in the middle of like a, an early heat wave or something here yeah. in the UK, Ben, aren't we? Well, it's a nice Seems scene. like it, yeah. yeah. Is it roasting with you? It is incredibly hot where I am right now, yes. <laughs> Have you found your mini flying out of your hand because it's too sweaty to hold it? Pretty much, yes. It's flying off somewhere. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I have noticed every time I get home from work now, I have to open up the windows for maybe two hours just to let air in through the place because it just cooked. Man, if you guys think it's hot here now, wait till next weekend because these two... These two are getting on a plane together and flying off yes. for a fancy pants weekend, aren't you? Yeah, 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 yeah. four star yeah. hotel. What you off doing? Uh, we're off to Brno covering a uh, European Masters for Privateer Press, which should be a good laugh. Yeah, Ben, are you looking forward to it? Yeah, it should be really cool. Hopefully we have some good stuff uh, talking with the Privateer Press guys. Learn a bit more about the new edition of the game coming out later this year as well. Mm. Should be pretty cool. Yeah. Well, that, that's the one thing I really, really want to try and do is see if I can echo out just a little bit more info about that Mark III that's coming out. Because oh, yeah. I don't know about anyone else, but I'm getting really excited to see how they've streamlined this game and made it better. What do you think, Lloyd? I don't know. I was too busy thinking of you guys dying in the heat over there. Because, like I said, <laughs> if you think it's hot no, here no, now. Yeah, no. Our hotel has a pool <gasps> and a jacuzzi. Are you going well, to go into the pool in the jacuzzi? Hell yeah! Are I'm using the facilities, man. Are you? Yeah. yeah. Ben, are you going to get into the pool in the jacuzzi? I might do. If, I it's, might if go it's warm enough, I'll be in the goddamn pool. And are you going to be live blogging this, this jacuzzi session? Oh yeah, it'll be on... Uh, <laughs> oh, and suddenly we lost 10,000 subscribers. <laughs> ah. It'll be on Periscope. I'll just do a Periscope session in the pool, you see. So. Oh. Uh, no, I am looking forward to this because it's going to be interesting <laughs> to see how the event goes. You know, it's, it's in a beautiful city. I've been having a look online. Uh, the city of Brno itself is a really, really quintessential t city, I think it is. But it's just beautiful architecture. And I was actually chatting to Roman this week. He tells me it's not too far from a small chapel entirely made of human bones. Wow. Wow. That, what do you think of that? A bit Human bones. You. Is that on the itinerary of things to go and see then for us, Justin? <laughs> if we get a little time, I wouldn't mind going to see some stuff like that because for it would me, be cool. I've never been outside the British Isles before. Mm. Awesome. So this, this is going to be a culture shock right. for me. You haven't been outside the UK at all. Yeah. Oh my goodness, how are you going to handle this? I'm, I'm a starve. If I, if I can't find a McDonald's, I'm a starve. Yeah. <laughs> because um, you have some preferences and how you like to eat I'm a carnivore. <laughs> Justin doesn't eat veg. I eat some. Your, your adventures in Europe are going to be funny. <laughs> right. No, it's going to be like an idiot abroad. It's going to be beautiful. You think? Yeah, yeah. I'll be called Pilkington. <laughs> 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 so we had Justin Games Extreme last week on the weekend. Yeah. Right? And now we're, next week we're going to have uh, Justin, Justin and Ben's Adventures in Europe. <laughs> Justin Gaming Abroad. <laughs> Honestly, I'm looking forward to it. I think it should be a great event. I'm looking forward to meeting some of the guys from Privateer Press face-to-face -face and actually getting to know some of the gamers that are actually at the Masters because these are some of the best players in Europe. Yeah, yeah it should be really good. Sounds yeah. really cool. And you guys are, are going to be live blogging this internet. Permitting, Assum yes. Assuming the internet is up and running and is good enough to do this. Yeah, it reminds me. I have a few of, bit of an equipment list to pass you later. <gasps> Stuff that I need to go and sort get, get, out. Get the company card out. I'm, I'm, I'm going to need a few things. What day is this, the live blog? And if you're, if you're leaving here on the Thursday... Yeah, well, we, we travel all day Thursday. Yeah. Uh, there's sort of a, a pre-event kickoff on the Friday. The main event is on the Saturday. And then there's a bit of a wind down on the Sunday. So we'll, we'll probably try and live blog through all three days. Yeah. yeah. But at the end of each day, we will just 
you know, do a little video saying, well, that's it for today, guys. We'll move on and we'll see you tomorrow. When are you yeah. going to squeeze in your jacuzzi session? Whenever we're not live blogging, <laughs> or the day before when I get there, or on the Monday <laughs> before we leave. Oh, dear. Because we don't fly back till Monday evening. God, you're going to come back roasted. Yeah, oh, I'm, I'm, like I'm a bit of lobster. Totally. It's going to be freaky. <laughs> right. Uh, moving Maybe on. It's color. What? Think, talking about stuff that's coming up next week. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, the Infinity Campaign Operation Flame Strike has been running for mm -hmm. weeks now and it's been uber, uber popular. Yeah. It's got well over 4,000 people who've joined. Mm -hmm. It's had well over 6,000 battle reports put into the system. I mean, 6,000 wow. battle reports, Ben. Yeah. 6,000. Pretty insane. It's crazy. <laughs> if, if bring it up there on the screen, Justin. Uh, yeah, so this, this is the homepage. So this is flamestrike.warconsole.com, where we've actually been running this. And what you can see on here is actually the map of where you've been fighting in yep. the Infinity Universe. So this is Flammy Island, I believe, Yelloid? Yes. So uh, what all are we seeing here? Because this actually looks different from the last time I see it. It looks as if there have been more locations opened up for people to battle in, yeah? Well, as the campaign's been going on, it started with four, mm -hmm. then we had another one, and then we had a three all at the same time. Right. Just to keep people interested in coming back. and Because mm. uh, 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 if, if, you, if you went away from the campaign, Aye. you were missing out on battling the new locations and mm -hmm. stuff that have opened up. And if yeah. you scroll on down... Yeah, sure thing. There, there is results and stuff. There's all sorts of oh. interesting... All That's sorts cool. of interesting graphs and stuff of mm -hmm. what's been going on in the campaign. So anyway, it's just a quick shout out mm. because it's it's due to end next week. At some point, I assume. It, I remember there was talk it of it. Was... There was talk of it ending this week, right. but we had some programming and stuff to do in the back end yeah. to allow us to close it off because we've got some bits and pieces that just need just a final tweak in the mm. code. Right. Well, you see, I remember Warren talking about the the AI historians that whenever this shuts down. The AI historians are going to come in and figure out what happened through the entire campaign to give the final results of what's going on here, which I think is really, really cool. Yeah. So it gives you that, that nice final ending to the story. Well, yeah, it's been, it's been awesome. Ben, have you enjoyed reading any of the battle reports and stuff? Because I know yeah. you've been working on some posts and highlighting them and things as, as the campaign's been going. Yeah, it's been fantastic following some of the guys that have been putting together the battle reports. Some people have done some really good videos and some fantastic pictures and really nice uh, sort of interesting and original styles of battle report. Like some guy, one guy did a, an entire poem around a battle report, which is pretty insane. So yeah, if you want to go and check those out, you can find them in the Infinity section of our sort of website, and there's a whole list of links and stuff to the web, to the uh, uh, Flame Strike website. Awesome. As well, right, yeah. guys, if you haven't joined in, time's running out. Go on, fight for your faction, get your battle reports in, see if you can make the difference. Awesome stuff. Right, yeah. moving on. We're going yes. to get on to some winners in a second. But before we jump on to announcing winners from mm -hmm. the likes of um, uh, Dark Age Week yep. and some of the other shows and stuff we've had recently, we have prizes to give away in this episode. Okay, what are we giving away, Lloyd? Protos are, have, have come in with some awesome stuff, okay? They're giving <laughs> right. away the Predator Youngbloods. Okay. They're giving away the Alien Face Huggers, <laughs> which you unboxed this week. Yeah, myself and John sat down to unbox these along with the Alien Queen, which was quite cool because it's... It's seeing those nice little extras that are adding more to your force, and then the big queen just being the big stompy monster, which is always fun. Yep, and they're giving away one of the sentinel guns as well. Do you know them really cool sentinel guns in the movie Aliens? Ben? Yeah. And yeah. they set them up in the corridor, and they just... Okay. Just splatting aliens left, right, and center. Right, so just so I'm clear, Youngbloods, that's the, the Predators from the first AVP movie. Yep. Facehuggers, we all know that that is, that's a facehugger. And the sentinel gun, which is a little turret, yeah? Yes. Awesome. And if, if you want to know anything more about that, like we've said, Justin has unboxed mm. the face huggers. Yeah. Next week, I believe we're going to see the young bloods. Yeah. And then I'm not sure. Maybe the week after that, or the week after that, we're going to get to see the Sentinel guns along with Marines. Is uh, it? Yeah. You see things like that. I like pairing up to actually show what they're going along with. So the face huggers I did with the Queen, the Sentry gun I'm going to do with the Marines because I just I think it's it's cooler to see them that way than yeah. just on their own. What do you think? Awesome stuff. I do. I like that. I like the fact that because it makes sense. Mm. The, the Marines with their hardware, with their gun. Aye, what they're going to deploy, yeah. Because that, cause that's one of my favourite parts of the Aliens movie, mm. is setting up the guns. And them sitting watching all the ammo counting down going... <laughs> yeah, it's very crap, cool. Crap, 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 They're like, like, I can't remember the numbers, but there's something stupid like 500 rounds, 300 rounds, 60 rounds, <laughs> 5 rounds. And then it like stops at like with one round or something remaining or so, something like that. It's yeah, a real cliffhanger yeah. moment. And it's uh, just like, <gasps> is it going to kill them all? Oh, they're safe. <laughs> <laughs> but now you're out of ammo and you only have one bullet left. Yes. 
Anyway, that's what you can win by commenting below here. Mm. Comment on Facebook. Yep. Comment on YouTube mm. and comment on Beast of War, and we will choose a winner from one of those platforms at random. Cool. So get commenting. Right. Prizes that we have to announce the winners of. Yes. Just I'm going to hand this over to you because uh, <coughs> I have the voice for it. You have the voice for it. <laughs> Tell us all about the Dark Age prize and who's won what. Okay, the first Dark Age prize was our mega starter bundle, which includes two 500 point starter forces, including the Forsaken, St. Luke, and the Dragiri Ice Cast sub factions. You're also getting the Forsaken book, which is signed, the core rules, which are signed, and all the tokens and templates you need to play the game. And our winner is, drumroll please! <laughs> Big Daddy-O from B.O.W. Congratulations, mate. You are now going to be able oh, to play yeah. Dark Age. That's our first jammy dancer. Yeah. Now <laughs> we have seven other people who are going to be winning a starter set and a signed copy of the core rulebook. So, uh -huh. our first winner is Kenny Cannon from Facebook. You're winning the Brood and the core rules, which are signed. Now, I am going to pick out who's getting which faction here yeah. because we were given a specific set. So, it is pot luck. If you don't get the one you want, I'm sorry, but it's free stuff. It's free! <laughs> exactly. So, <laughs> our next winner is Ali Bentley from YouTube. You're getting the core starter faction. Then we have Aramaki from BOW. You're getting the Kukulkani. Alberto Cordario from YouTube. You're getting the Ice Cast Degree. I'll get these put in the, in the post below, yep. just, just in case he's <laughs> slaughtering these names. Yeah, I kind of did that during the week. Whoopsies. Not that I can talk about slaughtering names. I did it all last week. Yep. Carry on. <laughs> Next up, we have Jason Filler from Facebook. You're getting the Firecaster Geary. We're then getting Branded1865 from BOW. You're getting the Aircaster Geary. And the last one is Rasmus from BOW. You're getting the Scarred Faction. Awesome stuff. So we've got eight Jammy Dancings. Eight jammy dancers all going for it. Thanks, Art. I'm not done yet. <laughs> oh, we have more. Yeah, we have another yeah, couple yeah. to give away. So, uh, if you'll remember from the weekend or a couple of weeks back, we were giving away the Aether's Captain game yeah. and all the stretch goals on that Kickstarter. Okay. So, we have a winner for that. It is Leigh Bennett, who actually submitted the correct answer, which was Antara. So, oh, awesome. that one we did a little differently, where we actually had a little form in the post on Beast of War that you had to submit into. Nine yep. jammy dancers. Number ten. <laughs> no, there's more! Last one. Okay. And this is the cool one. This is one of the coolest prizes we have ever given away. What do you mean this is the cool one? They were all cool prizes. Uh, but, <laughs> no, no, th this one is right back to my childhood. Anyone who's watched the, the video of myself, Warren and Alessio, playing Labyrinth, will know this is a cool prize. So, what we have to give away is a three-up of Jareth, the Goblin King from Labyrinth. Yeah. And our winner is... Miss Drink. M-R-S-D-R-I-N-K from B-O-W. Now, we did it a little ten. differently. Ten. I, hang on. Count it. It. Ten jammy yes. dancers. <laughs> but there's one little funny bit for this. For that yes. particular prize, we wanted them to put in a little limerick. Okay. Which I'm now going to read. Oh, this should be good. So this Come should on, be Justin. quite entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> there once was a goblin named Hoggle who wore his great beads on a toggle. Fairies he couldn't stand, so he squished them to sand, causing Sarah to be all a goggle. Yay! Congratulations. <laughs> Works very well. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm clapping too fast. What? I did good! <laughs> <laughs> you did. Also, I do want to say one thing. Yes. Uh, someone in the forums actually started a, a little well done post for me for Dark Age Week. I just want to say on camera to everybody thank you for all the kind words. I will try and keep up the good work. You've done good. The boy done good. I enjoyed it, and I really enjoy the world of Dark Age. So, for those who have won, hopefully you enjoy your games. What do you think, Lloyd? Absolutely. Ten jammy dancers, loads of cool prizes, loads of starter sets. Mm. I love seeing all the starter sets winging out from all the different factions. Yeah, yeah. Because then you get people playing all sorts of different flavours, mm -hmm. rather than everyone just going for one particular faction. Yeah. yeah. Awesome stuff. Yeah. Right. We're going to take a quick break, and then we're going to be back. Ben, you're going to take us through some news that's been coming on in the past week. Awesome. I will. See you in a sec. Humanity has been driven from Earth, but now it's time to take it back. Join the Reconquest and fight the Scourge on the Drop Zone Commander Hub at BeastsOfWar.com. Flames of War brings you the battles of World War II in epic 15mm scale. Go to the Hub on BeastsOfWar.com to find news, tactics and tutorials about the game. <coughs> oh, we're back! Hello! Boy. We're back. That's enough dummy dancing. Why? That was dummy dancing. You didn't win! Oh yes, moving on, moving on. Ben, <laughs> save me. What, what, what news have we this week? 
Okay, so the first thing is something from Northstar, who have been doing the uh, miniatures for the Frostgrave game. Uh, yeah. They've been doing a whole bunch of stuff in metal and plastic as well, but uh, they've turned their attention to some new captain models that you could use for your warbands or maybe for the Cell Swords expansion that works with uh, Frostgrave as well. So yeah, they've been showing off some really cool, nice painted models for this. So people are interested in this. It's nice to see them continuing to make their own miniatures and not just... Because a lot of people are using a lot of proxies and stuff. Mm. Yeah. But it's good, to see, it's good to see them not getting disheartened and they're going, yeah, yeah, we'll keep pushing our own miniature line. And the interesting stuff about this miniature line, if you go back one, Justin. Yeah, so this one. Yeah, is it's not, it isn't just Western fantasy stuff now. We're getting into um, likes of Arabia. And if you go the one before that. So this one. This one's got like an African sort of mask on it, Ben, doesn't it? Yeah, it's got some really cool, interesting designs in there. So, uh, and as well as that, not... They, some of them are definitely male figures, but some of them as well, you could sometimes get away with them being females and stuff. So it's not just the standard male template. You've got some guys that could look slightly androgynous and stuff like well, that. Well, we're looking as well. at the crossbow so, lady. Yeah, and yeah, that looks yeah. like a lady to me. Yeah, yeah that, that one, like and I think me. the one with the uh, the uh, sort of um, the halberd could probably be a woman as well. I reckon. So yeah, I think it's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. possibly, mm. possibly. See, I like the idea that they're not just saying our game, our leaders must be wizards. This is allowing you to have martial leaders. Yes. More of, you know, beat stick combat monsters to actually take out onto the tabletop with Frostgrave, which is yeah. a nice change. It's a good yeah. point, actually, because when I think Frostgrave, I just think wizards. Yeah. Mm. Barring, you know, magic yes. bolts and stuff. Ah, lightning! But that's a good but, point. Having, ben, you've played a bit of Frostgrave. Yeah. How does, it, how does it work? How does it bring it into the likes of the soldiers and stuff we're looking at, these are your henchmen, your minions, or, or what, what, what way does it work? Yeah, so you could use these as your standard sort of henchmen in your normal wizards gangs, and yeah. well, wizards warbands, but there is also a PDF downer, which is the Cell Swords expansion, which allows you to drop the wizard in favour of a martial leader, like a soldier that can lead your troops into battle that way instead. So it gets rid of some of the spells and replaces them with skills and upgrades and things like that. You still have the normal soldiers that you'd have in a regular game, but you have a non-spellcaster as your leader instead. Yeah. Oh. So, so it, it gives you a nice different play style that you can run with for this game, which I really like, because as much as I like my little Chronomancer wizard, it's nice just to have a guy who can run up the field and do a ton of damage to all the minions in front of him. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Awesome stuff. I'm really going to have to get a game of this. You guys have been playing it mm -hmm. it's good regularly fun. Yeah. and stuff. Yeah, well, I mean, like, I, I have my Dwarf Warband. Now, I know it's all meant to be humans at the minute, but you can proxy, and I've just thought, you know what, Dwarven Wizard, let's go. Let's have some fun with that. Yeah, very fun. A dwarven wizard? Dwarven I thought wizard. dwarves didn't like, like magic. He's an odd one. Dwarves like magic as long as it is contained and easily regulated. That's the way they think. So yeah, they're the health and safety of the magic world. Yeah. <laughs> and as long I, as I, I have this magic rock. Would you like to hold my magic rock? By the way, it's a grenade. There I will hold your magic <laughs> rocks. Yes. Yeah. By the way, I'm holding this pin. Boom. What? It's a grenade. Oh. <laughs> what? Get back, back on point. I don't think dwarves like magic, not unless it gives them gold. Exactly, that's probably the best. And that's way probably it, yeah. why they're not in this game yet. <laughs> <laughs> right, moving on. Uh, What's yeah. next? There's something massive to show us, Ben. Again. Yeah. Yeah. So this is from uh, TT Combat, and they do a whole bunch of uh, really fantastic terrain. But this one seriously blows most of the other kits in t sort of 28 mil and 35 mil out of the water. This is their huge sort of tower block that they've called the Galaxy Building. And it is as big as it seems. It's about 120 centimeters tall. And you could actually move around all your models inside there and stuff like that. It has a proper ground floor, lots of different apartment blocks, uh, sort of flats up above it, and like a, a stairway as well. Just absolutely insane. Now, yeah. when I first seen this building, mm -hmm. I was looking at Justin, I was going thinking to myself, who has a gaming table big enough? To fit that. To put the building on. <laughs> Let's see the building. Yeah. Who has a gaming table big enough to put that on to play a game? I don't know. We but do. No, no, but wait, then I realised, if you go to the, like a side view, mm -hmm. it kind of dawned on me, this is the gaming table. Yeah. Yes. The game yeah. takes place in the building. Yeah. yeah. Because there's all the floors and stuff to fight on. You don't yeah, actually I mean, have a gaming table as you such. You have these side walls that are coming out that are letting you play level to level, which I really, really like the idea of. They have yes, this as salute. And you see once you're standing next to this thing and actually seeing just how huge it is, you're yeah. looking up at it going, um, 
Um, okay, I may need to actually set my gaming table maybe a foot lower just so I can reach that top floor. Because <laughs> this, this is a 10-story high, 28 mil yeah. building, and it's huge. They're showing it all for the Batman Mini, and that kind of makes sense, because with something like this, you could replicate one of their moments from the film where you're fighting through floors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Even, even the current uh, Batman versus Superman movie that's out, mm. he starts on a lower floor and he bursts yeah. his way up. I, yeah. Even just for regular adventure games. I mean, like, say you were a role player and you were playing something like... I don't know, let's say uh, Paranoia. Yeah. You could actually use this as, say, an underground skyscraper. Yeah. That you're then having to move your way up and through and explore, which could be a lot of fun. The one yeah. uh, example of this that I thought was really cool is that someone mentioned um, the movie The Raid and Dread. And oh, you could, yes. You could do a really cool version of The Raid or Dread with this, where you're fighting up to the different floors against the gangs and stuff. Hell yeah. Maybe, like, distress it a bit and make it into something from sort of, like, maybe Necromunda as well. Mm -hmm. Try and give it that gothic feel. But, yeah, it'd be pretty awesome. Very cool. What people haven't probably thought of is the, mysterio is the sheer amount of furniture you're going to need to furnish this building. <laughs> <laughs> well, there, That's why it's just the bad building. That That's all. So. <laughs> why is it in the news, Ben? Because it was at Salute. Why has it made it way, its way back into the news? Has it been released? Probably. Yeah, it's now properly on their web store now, so you can go and get it. Yeah, mm. yeah. Excellent stuff. Definitely want to take a Right, look. Ben, what's next? So the next is something from Figon, and they're a French company, and they've done some fantastic miniatures in the past. Uh, we looked at one, which is the Moloch, their huge giant, uh, which was just insane. But now they've got another piece, which is 85 millimeters tall, and it is their old blood, their orc shaman, and it looks fantastic, this one. You've got a real thing for this company, Ben, because you keep bringing up these fabulous miniatures. I, I say miniatures. They're not really that small. What is this, 75 millimeters tall? It's a, well, it, it's 85 millimeters 85. tall, so it's absolutely massive. Yeah, this one, yeah. I actually really, really like this. I mean, like, I love playing giants in games, and if I wanted to play an alternate ogre giant, hell yeah, this is what I'm going for right here. Look you at think that I thing. Could, you think you could use it as an ogre? It's not just a massive giant orc, then? I, I would use it as a giant. Yeah, he's been like imbued with the strength of his uh, the nature and stuff like that, and sort of grown massive on the power. That'd be pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, very cool. I think I'm looking at it and thinking it's huge because you did bring up a picture and the and the miniature was this small yeah, compared no, no, no. to it. I've got it here. Let me I've got, got it here. That. So there, there's your one for scale. <laughs> so yeah. it's almost it's about 18 inches tall. Whenever Do, it's on that base. I think we've touched on this before. Can you buy a mini this size and really justify playing it on the table? For yes. example. Let's take your orcs okay. that you're working on for Kings of War. Yeah, yeah. Right? If you just stick this guy right in the middle of them as a big orc champion. Hell yes. He is Grognar, the, gor the orc god of war. Well, there is only 150 of them. So oh, yeah, it is limited edition. So if yes. anybody is interested in doing that, it's going to go pretty quick. In fact, uh, there's at least 20 that, or something of that them makes it, straight away. That yeah. makes it even more special if it's, you know, it's a rare thing. So whenever you put it down on the tabletop, you're putting down something that people aren't really going to have seen before that you can really go to town on and really put your craft into. So I that think that cool. just makes it extra special once you get this on the tabletop. What do you think, Ben? Yeah, I think it'd be a really good idea to try and work it into the battlefield in some way. I mean, I also like the idea of him maybe not even just necessarily being part of the battle and you don't have to move him around and stuff, but maybe he, like gives his magical power to other things on the tabletop, so he's sort of there at the back, almost like a figurehead, a general, sort of watching over the orcs. That'd be pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. So. Very cool. Very, very cool idea. It does look awesome. Mm. I mean, yeah. I can't, can't help it. Let's, let's, let's just go back to looking at it again with all the horns and stuff. All right, <laughs> so this is it. Paint it. Yeah. Or do you want to unpaint uh, Go to the other view where you can see all the horns and stuff. This one? No. Yeah, well, that's pretty... It looks like... He almost looks like he's got... He, like he's a giant bagpipe. He's got so many things coming out of him. <laughs> no, that, that's Maybe. trophies. And on his back, that looks like lunch. You know, just sitting <laughs> gnawing on a ma massive boat. You might run into the scale problem again if you're going to have to, say, kill some massive beasts to get skulls and Yeah, but it's, it's a fantasy world. There's nothing to say that there isn't, you know, the great white elk of the north that he could be hunting down. I suppose. Look, he's got skulls on him. Go back to the painted version. Yeah, yeah. What size is those skulls? Oh, he doesn't have the skulls on him. He yet. does. That you can see it just in behind there. They're like the skulls of giants and giant animals that they herd in the mountains of the north. There you go. Yeah, so, so this, this giant, <laughs> this giant oak or, or oak, orc, a giant oak, this giant orc mm. has kicked the crap out of some giants yeah. themselves. Yeah. You know, if, if if a regular orc is bigger and nastier and meaner than your everyday human, an orc giant is going to be even bigger and going to be able to rip the limbs off regular giants. <laughs> cool. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Right, Ben. Moving on. What's next? What's yeah, the last so, bit of news? 
Yeah, so the next bit is something from uh, the guys at Paolo Parente's Dust and Dust Models. Uh, they've brought out a Panzer 4 K kit, which is their take on a Weird World War tank from the uh, Axis faction, yeah. And it could be used for tactics and battlefield, this one. Wow. It's cool. It, it, yeah. It's different. It, it's nice to see that it's actually got a World War II base. Exactly, you know, This yeah. looks like something from really early on yeah. in the, the Weird World War, where they're just beginning conversions to some of these vehicles. Well, it's still only 1947 in this universe. You say True. only 1947 in this universe. Uh, Something so, like this looks as if it's from earlier than that. So look around the 1943, 1944 era. Yeah, but there's era. still going to be stuff that survived and got retrofitted. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah but th yeah. that's what I'm saying. This might be some of the, the first kit that would have been retrofitted. So what's the easiest way to bring out a new type of weapon? Let's see if we can stick it into a vehicle we already have. Yes. Exactly, yeah. And, and yeah. speaking of that, mm. the, you can get this kit in two ways at the minute. Oh, in fact, you just brought it up. Yeah. You can go and buy your own um, 148th scale kit. Yeah. And then buy this weapon upgrade and stick it on it. Uh -huh. and hey, presto, you're pretty much golden. Yeah. Or you can buy the the professionally painted version mm. of this, but the professionally painted version of this is like it's about 120 quid. Yeah, mm. it's pretty pretty expensive. Which is kind of steep. Whereas the weapon upgrade is eight pounds, or is it eight dollars? It's something like that. Yeah. It's about eight dollars, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I like the idea. I like the fact that for those guys who are traditional World War II players who don't want to instantly jump into your massive, stompy walkers of doom. This is something a bit more familiar to take those first baby steps into weird, weird world war. Well, it's like I've said in the show in the past, I like this, this direction. Mm. The walkers and stuff are cool. That's what drives, drives people into that game to begin with. Yeah, yeah. Then you want to mix it and ground it mm -hmm. in reality with having equipment like this that's mm -hmm. been retrofitted and brought in and still used. Yeah. Ben, are you yeah. any last words on, on the new dust stuff? Yeah, I think it looks pretty cool. I, 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 as I, I'm on your, sort of your side of things with this, I really like that they're sort of taking those vehicles that would have been used during World War II and retrofitting them with bits and pieces. There are other weapon sections and stuff you can get for the different factions and sometimes for infantry as well. Mm. So yeah, I think it's a really cool idea and it sort of engages you to try and do a bit sort of like bits boxing and sticking things together and just seeing how it works really. Yeah, mm -hmm. pretty cool. It, nice. It'll be interesting to see what the rules-wise, uh, because I believe there is pictures of cards and stuff Mm. Yes, the, yeah, there are the rules website, and stuff up there, yeah. Which I haven't had a chance to really get stuck into yet to mm. see are they, are they for the current set or is there changes in there from knowing that they're going to change rules? Mm. Well, it works for tactics and battlefield at the moment. So it works it for definitely two, works uh, for them. Yes, yeah. Okay. It works for both the, get the books that are out at the moment, yeah, and the, way, the two ways of playing, yeah. All right, okay. Very cool. Well, interesting enough. It'd be interesting to see, see when the new rules come out. What I basically want is a new pack of cards and you just buy it. Yeah, and you're done. Yeah. Mm. And just go, oh, that's That'd be good. Yeah. Update. Here's everything in your army. Here's the pack of cards. Find what you're using. In fact, I prefer it if it went up as a free download. <laughs> download <laughs> here, update all your old, well, old models if, to the if, new rules. If it was coming out as a pack of cards, what I'd like to see is maybe doubles or triples of everything in there because some people will run doubles or triples of vehicles and stuff in their armies. You know, yeah. just so that you're not having one card and you're having to share it between you three do, vehicles. You, yeah, you do get doubles and stuff in the, in the packs. Oh right, okay. As, fair as it stands, they've okay, done that. Fair so I've, I've had some. I've had some of the packs, and I've okay. like, well, I've two of that and two of this and stuff okay. like that. So, Grant. Yes, it, does, it is like that. Right, I'm going to move us on mm -hmm. because we've got an awesome interview with Matt Hart from Steamforge Games. Mm -hmm. He's in the, yeah. to talk about Dark Souls. Surprisingly enough, I wonder why he's come in <laughs> to talk about Dark Souls. Could it be because it's gone through the stratosphere? It's, it's, <laughs> it's <laughs> nuts. Nuts the way people have just went. Oh my God, I must have it. Right, let's see what he had to say. Anime cyberpunk style meets skirmish combat in Infinity. Experience eight high-tech factions and fight to control the human sphere at the Infinity Hub on beastofwar.com. Become a general of mighty armies at the Kings of War Hub. Take command of elves, dwarves and orcs in this game of masked fantasy combat on beastofwar.com. All right, guys, so I'm pretty excited. We have... Uh, Matt Hart here from Steamforge Games to tell us all about Dark Souls. Matt, my goodness, this Kickstarter's just gone uh, atmospheric. It's through the roof. It's went nuclear. It's, uh, <laughs> I'd like to say it's caused by surprise. Um, it has, dramatically. Um, we, we had some wild dreams and, and hopes that, you know, we knew Dark Souls was an amazing license and we knew that this one could be a big one, but wow, you know, it's just blown us away. It, it really has just gone out there. And with that in mind, I guess you're sitting thinking, 
well, Dark Souls was definitely the way to go, because I was sitting thinking to myself, uh, what brought you to Dark Souls? But um, obviously I'm unaware of, the, of just the, the sheer amount of people who are interested in the Dark Souls universe, yeah. because it's not, really, it's not a video game that I've ever actually played. I've watched a lot of videos about how it plays and stuff like that. Mm. Matt, if you can tell us, you know, what drew you to, to Dark Souls? I mean, why did you look at Dark Souls and go, that has to have a board game? So, uh, I mean, a long, long time ago, um, I, I, I found Dark Souls 1 and uh, fell in love with the dark, gritty world. Um, and what's interesting about Dark Souls is that the, the game is, uh, it harks back to the hardcore old school days where it's, it's punishingly hard, but yet every single time you die, you know it's your fault. You made a mistake. You, you, you made the wrong move. Um, and, and I think that's attracted quite a quite rightly, quite a, quite a strong following. So it's not, it's not the kind of video game that will do you know, ridiculously big numbers like you know, Madden or FIFA or, or Halo or GTA, but it actually has a really solid um, and active fan base. Um, and the, the nature of the game just encourages people to keep playing and keep sharing their experiences. Yeah, while, so, while you're talking about the, the nature of the game, Matt, you see, that's part of the thing. I'm looking at the game going, a game that punishes you and, 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 and defeats you and makes well, you and makes you attack again and again and again. It's not, it's not, it's, I look at it and go, it's not exactly the first game I would pick and uh, think that's going to make a cracking board <laughs> game. A, bit, a game that beats you into submission. Well, hang on. <laughs> We've seen that happen a few times before with different board games. This one in particular worked really well because of the way the game has been designed. So Dark Souls itself, I've actually just started playing. So yes, I am at the beginning stages of going, crap, I died. Crap, I died. Crap, I died. It's a, the boss was left on this much health. Crap, I died. But it's one of those things that makes it really fun is that you're working toward it. The other thing I love is, in the games themselves, the lore of the world is sort of hidden, so you have to go mining for it, yeah. which allows people to come up with tons and tons of theories. So, Matt, um, yeah, I mean, did you not look at this and go, is this going to be fun? Does the, does the, does the trial try and, and failure thing come across in the board game, and is it enjoyable? Are people who have enjoyed the... The, the yeah. video game, for example, going to enjoy the, the board game, is it, is it like that? No, absolutely. I think, you know, I think you can look at um, anything in the world from two different angles. And I think sometimes the image that people want to portray is, is actually merely that, a projection, and their actual real feelings is, is completely different. And if you look at Dark Souls and, you know, like the machismo attached with it, oh, it's brutally hard, oh, I died a thousand times, or, you know, all that kind of stuff. What you're actually saying, in a way, is this game is so challenging that I wear every single failure as a badge of honor because I know that every single failure is a step towards when I am going to be successful. And going back to what you were saying, Justin, the, 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 the feeling that you go in, you first meet a boss and he just wipes the floor with you. Yeah. And then, so you go back, you, you respawn back at the bonfire, you have to fight your way back through to the, to the fog gate, mm -hmm. you get into the boss arena, and this time... You're, you now know that when he, when he raises his hand, he's going to do this, so that's the timing for you to dodge. You dodge that, and now he pulls a new attack out, and you're like, oh, my God, and if you react fast enough, it's great. You're still in the fight. But inch by inch by inch, you learn the game. You learn what you can do. You learn how, how to fight, how to, how to behave in certain areas, and, and that is, is actually the thing that people are finding incredibly rewarding. And it's, like I said earlier, it's just like um, it harks back to that old-school kind of feeling where it's, it's harsh, but it's, but it's impossibly fair. Mm. And, you know, modern video game development has, has kind of steered away from that in terms of, you know, there's a consumer desire that, you know, and quite rightly in, in many regards, people have spent their 40 or 50 quid on a, on a new Xbox or a PlayStation game, and they want to see all of the content they paid for. So there's this, you know, concept of easy modes. There's, you know, the, the gameplay has, you know, has been simplified a little bit. There's loads of save points, so people never actually feel like, you know, they have to go back too far. Because, you know, the reason why developers do this is, is every single time someone dies in a game is a potential point where they will never play that game again. And obviously, the more people play your game, the more engaged with it they are and the less likely they are to move on to another product. So uh, Dark Souls um, embraces that and it, it says this is part of the whole experience. You know, do you want to try one more time to get that a little bit further? So are you finding players who come to actually try the board game going, oh, I failed. I want, I, I want to go straight back in there and give that another shot. Mm. Uh, and how does the game represent the exploration in Dark Souls? Because the Dark Souls story is kind of strange in so much as uh, the way the game's built, it doesn't drip feed you the story. You have to go out and explore it. Mm. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, I mean, like, it's from what I've been playing so far, for me, the first layers of the story I've been finding is the different items and stuff I've been picking up. So I've been reading descriptions and stuff from yeah. there and actually beginning to build a flavor of the world and actually build that world in my mind. And that is a very deliberate piece of design work from the original creator. Uh, I was watching a, a couple of videos on YouTube. Apparently in his younger days, he was actually reading Western RPGs because he was still learning English. There were parts of the story he couldn't get. So that's a real design philosophy he brought into the Dark Souls universe. I'm wondering, has that made it through to the board game, Matt? The, the board game actually um, exists across uh, all three games. So it exists in the Dark Souls universe. And for us to be able to deeply embed the, the lore, I, I, we felt would be a mistake. Um, mm -hmm. So we have made sure that the game feels like a Dark Souls experience. Mm -hmm. There is um, obviously flavor built into the game to mm -hmm. give you that experience that you, you know that you are exploring the, the, the Dark Souls world. Mm -hmm. There are hints at the lore, but um, you know, the, the constraints that we have when working with someone else's IP and the and the boundaries of a license, I mean, we, we, we can't invent new lore, we can't invent new stories, you know, um, but what we can do is make sure that the game feels like it's you know, you are exploring the Dark Souls world. Mm -hmm. Well that's well, that's probably can, yeah. probably a good way to go because yeah. In the video game, I, I've been exploring it, and people are, are really excited about making up their own law. They make up the stuff to fill the gaps. Well, and, right. and with the likes right. of a board game, what do, what do you do with board games and RPGs and stuff like that? You, you make up story stories. and stuff. So, yeah. so it's, it's given people that, that ultimate freedom to build their stories in the Dark Age universe. So, yeah, I like that idea. You say you're drawing stuff from all three. Does that mean we see characters and monsters and stuff from all three games appearing in this? Correct, yeah. I mean, we have uh, deliberately focused on the earlier Dark Souls. Um, one of the things um, I, I was very keen for us to avoid was, was in any way spoiling parts of, uh, of Dark Souls 3. You know, the launch of the Kickstarter campaign was, you know, only a week after the launch of the, the actual video game. Uh, and it would be unfair on people for us to, to kind of reveal things that they have yet to discover in the game. But, you know, future, future plans will definitely be uh, involving uh, bringing more of the Dark Souls 3 um, enemies and, and bosses into, into the board game space. Right, well, one of the other things I'm wondering about is, one of the things I always love about Dark Souls, now that I've actually got into it, is the character customization. I love gathering up new gear, new equipment. Do we have that in the video, or, or in the board game, where characters are going to level up, gain new gear, and actually maybe change miniatures or something? What uh, kill stuff and take their loot? Absolutely, it wouldn't be a it wouldn't be a dungeon style exploration game without it. Um, so it's it's one of those where uh, the longer you play the game, the more difficult it becomes on one hand. But the longer you play the game, the easier it becomes on the other hand. So I mean, you guys have um, you're aware of um, our design philosophy with Gilball and how we like to create. Um, tension within the, the game engine. So mm -hmm. there's that kind of hazy middle ground of do I, don't I, do I, don't I. And so the longer you play the game of Dark Souls, the more likely you are to get invaders coming into your world. Mm -hmm. And that ramps up the difficulty significantly. Cool. But similarly, the longer you play and the more souls you collect, the more treasure you find, the more equipment and skills that you can level up, the, the easier the ultimate goal will be, which is take on the, the boss and, and kill him, mm -hmm. which is the, the point of the scenario. Okay. So. You, you have to kind of really be thinking about both of those axes where you're, do I grind the, the game into the dust and then, you know, the, the boss fight is a cakewalk. Well, guess what? We've thought of that and, and no, that's not going to happen. The game is going to be challenging all the way through. Nice. Uh, one of the interesting things about Dark Souls is you're actually dead. Yeah. If you haven't <laughs> played the game or, or seen anything about it, you're actually a dead person. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm dead. You're, well, you're dead. You, you've you and, died. And, and in the video game, you die multiple times, and you just yeah. become more and more dead yeah. as you approach something called Hollow, yeah. which is basically where you've died so many times you've lost all, all remnants of any humanity you had. Mm -hmm. Does that happen, in the, does that, does that happen in, in the board game? I mean, if I die lots of times, do I become more hollow? And, or how is, that, is that represented in the, in the, in the board game? It's, it's one of those things that we, are, um, we have on our list of um, how to build in lose conditions. Um, one of the things about Dark Souls, the video game, is it is an endless um, opportunity for you to farm or grind or, or explore, you know, whatever word you want to use for it. You, you can keep going, like Justin was saying, that boss. You can keep going and going and going and going until you eventually you, you, you click it and you kill him or you wimp out and you don't play the game again, right? <laughs> yeah. um, 
Whereas in the board game space, that's just not going to work. So, you know, a board game ostensibly is, is, a, is, a, is an excuse for a group of friends to get together and share an experience and have some fun together. So it's, a, it's more of a social contract side of kind of thing rather than an individual endeavor. And so I think for people to have some kind of frame of reference when they come together, having easily identifiable win and lose conditions, I think is going to be important. And that is a slight departure from, you know, the core Dark Souls ethos. Yeah. So using something like Hollowing as, as a mechanic that enables us to keep track of how many people die, or how many times someone dies, and, and if they actually reach Hollow, then they, you know, perhaps they have one last chance to do it, and if they don't, that's it, game over. Yeah. It's definitely something we're looking to build into, into the game. But that, that's going to come a little way down the track once the... The core game loop is is polished, and then we can then start working out what's appropriate in terms of win lose conditions, so on and so forth. Yeah, Matt. In the in, in the video game, there's quite a few different options of of what you can do to level your character. You can level them towards magic, you can level them towards speed, you can level them towards basically just being a big brute tank. It doesn't, where I'm going. it doesn't move very much, but basically just takes the damage and deals with it. Yeah, yeah. Is it, is it, I'm I'm assuming it's the same in the board game. If I got four people together. Justin's maybe gone brute. I've maybe gone all magical. Well, let, let's be honest here. There's only one person in our gaming <laughs> group who is going to go brute. That's going to be Warren, and he's going to be screaming Leroy Jenkins as he charges off into the night to murder things. How, how does the game? How does the game handle that, Matt? I mean, do I level up? And if I leveled up in in one game, do I do I carry out those six skills and stuff across into the next? Is that is that how it works? No. So we. Uh, it's one of the the. The hot topic questions is why isn't there a campaign system? And um, there, there is a micro campaign system in so far as the game revolves around first finding a mini boss, leveling up, you know, building out your skills and equipment. So following the path that you want to follow. So if you're a sorcerer, you want to make, want, might want to strengthen your magic side of things. If you're, you know, a knight, then you might, you know, be looking to accrue the armor and the and the and the weapons. And then once you've defeated the mini boss, the game effectively resets. So uh, where you defeat the boss, um, that, that tile stays on the, on the table. Um, you pick all the other tiles up, you shuffle them, you flip them over because they're double-sided, you put the bonfire tile down attached to the, to, the, to the mini boss tile, and then you start exploring again, and the idea is to find the main boss. And we have a concept of a thing called a mega boss as well, so if you want a longer game experience or a longer campaign-like feeling to it, uh, then you would then, once you've defeated the main boss, continue to kind of um, explore and find the mega boss and ultimately take on the mega boss. But what we want to do is create this encapsulated game experience feel um, because I find, sometimes I find when I play games like Descent or um, Imperial Assault that you kind of, you do the scenario and it kind of feels me, leaves me feeling a little bit like, well, I know there's another thing. So I don't know if I can celebrate the victory or whether that feels like a, an achievement, you know, until we do the next thing, until we get to the final mission and Darth Vader kicks our butts, you know, like it, it kind of, it, that continuation I don't necessarily think is always a good thing. Um, but in terms of leveling up, you'll be able to expand the skills that you have, the options that you have as a, as a you know, as a player character, uh, and also you'll strengthen your, the, the depth of, ex uh, of ability you have. So you'll get access to the better dice or better dice results. There'll be things like, you know, uh, better critical results that you you know that you get you know all, all kinds of stuff that that will make the feel the, the character feel like they're expanding as you play through. And this all happens in one play session. Uh, yeah. Oh. Okay. oh. I mean, a lot, a lot, yeah, here's I the thing, question. right? As a as a designer of a board game, it's incredibly hard to completely control people's player experience, and I fully expect that there will be people doing homebrew campaign systems. I suspect there'll be people doing you know, RPG light kind of um, hacks of the system. So all I can do is present the core game experience that I think is is meaningful for for the 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 target experience. And oh. The target experience is that two to three hours, sit down for an evening with a with a bowl of chips and some coke with you with your mates and you play a game and, and basically you're working together to to try and defeat the game. I'm um, really liking the way you're going with this map because like yourself, in in joined up campaigns, I get that feeling that you can't that, sort of that, track. that was a bit easy. That took us a while to do, but it was a bit easy. Mm. I need to play another mission, and then 
and then you're and then you're going away at the end of the night feeling I didn't really accomplish anything. I really like this idea of sitting down for a session and, and, and walking away truly satisfied with my progression mm. and the overall experience of the evening, rather than sitting walking away thinking, "Well, next time we'll do this." Aye, and or, then we have another one after that before yeah. we do the final one after that. But I really like the idea of jumping into a game and, like you say, playing it in one in one session and, and walking away feeling that happened, this happened, this happened, mm. and not thinking, "Oh, but if only we'd gone here or done that." Aye. I yeah. have one question, one important question. Do you level up as a group, or can someone just run off and overpower everything while everybody else left is left hanging back a little bit? Yeah. <laughs> that entirely depends on your group of people. So I guess you're thinking about Warren right now. Uh, yes, uh, yes. Um, that that that's that's the boundaries of your social contract. So um, in theory, someone could hoover up all the gear, um, right, and uh, could run away with it. But I would suspect <laughs> that super solo in it would end up being. Uh, a mistake because of the, the the tactical nature of the game and the way that the aggro token works means that that person will very quickly become the focus of all of the enemies and will probably end up very dead. Um, and so I would I would rather dissuade you from pursuing that. But you know we all know Warren; he's going to try it at least once. So. Yeah, yeah, and I'll I'll probably do it once or twice just because I think it'll be funny whenever I'm you know sitting with Warren, John, and Lloyd here, and just we're sitting down and going, right, I'm gonna just kill everything. Yeah, you're going like, but there's nothing to kill. I, you've took all the loot. I know it's shiny. <laughs> or you're, it's, you're I mean, assuming soul, you'll be brave. Souls are something that you, you will collect on an individual level, you know, as as and when things are, are killed. But uh, things like treasure drops, yeah. um, conceptually, is is part pie treasure to use a like an RPG ah, term. So essentially, all the loot drops out on the table, and then they get allocated out to people who who want them. So okay. then that becomes that kind of, you know social level of interaction and saying well that that would work better on me or i'm trying to pursue this particular path you know blah 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 yeah okay with, cool with, with um just going back to characters and stuff mm -hmm. how have you visually represented them because in the video game you can be you can be quite grotesque right up to looking reasonably normal yeah. what 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 was your approach to that um yeah we i mean unfortunately the the limitations of a physical game um kind of really kick in at this point so we took a a middle groundish approach where the characters look archetypically like the character, like the player characters from the game. Yeah. Uh, so they're not um, they're not undead, and then you replace your model with you know with a with an almost human looking model at some point in time in the game. I just I don't think the I just don't think the physical limitations of a thirty two mil model is is makes that a worthwhile additional expense for the player. Mm. Um, I think players just want to know that they're they're the cleric, or they're the knight, or they're the the assassin, and and making sure that the the silhouettes of the models are, are very clear, so it's very easy to identify who your playing piece is on the board. So, you know, you pick your you pick your model um, and and your character class, and you play with that. If you do happen to discover some of the named armor, so like maybe maybe you find the the onion knight armor, uh, and you have that particular model, you can then swap the model out. So you take your cleric away. And you put the Onion Knight model down, and you have the the cool kind of um, spanky Onion Knight armor and and the cool looks to go with it. So there is uh, there is a, an aesthetic change, but normally to denote key functionality change. So i.e. the Onion Knight armor gives you a significant um, uh, shift, you know, in terms of how your armor behaves. Yeah, and, and talking about aesthetics of the game, the aesthetics uh, you've you've done a really good job on creating. Miniatures and stuff for the for the big bosses. I, I've been browsing down the page, going, "That looks very like what I seen in the video game." Yeah, uh, a really good selection of them. I take it you're 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 bound then to the actual video games, the IP. You can't just go off and create your own monsters and things. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, yeah, I do, uh, all of the stuff that we do is um, is is from scratch, but it's um, is referenced directly from the in-game assets and the um, and a load of high-res uh, video and also um, the the concept art that that Namco sent over to us. Um, and there is a checks and balances to to make sure that that we are staying true to the world. Um, everything that we do goes through to Namco and ultimately into From Software. Um, all the way up to the top to get signed off and make sure that everyone in the loop is happy with it. So um, I think uh, I quite enjoy it, it even though the, the approval process does take time and it adds, yeah. a, it adds a little bit of a delay, like it feels like a delay. 
we've just planned around it and it's just one of those things that that I think is really important uh, when you're dealing with someone else's IP and you know I've got long experience of, of working with other people's IP um, and and knowing how how respectful you need to be of it and making sure that you stay true to it is, is, is the most important thing to us. I also believe you've had 15 years experience in the actual video games market, not that just, not just war like games. That's a long time when you say 15 years, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. yeah. I, I feel young again. Oh, oh, God. Three wishes, I'd burn them all on being 10 years younger. <laughs> <laughs> with with, with um, the likes of, well, there's From Software, the developer, and there's Bandai Namco, with the publisher. Mm. Uh, Spartan Games, for example, deal pretty much directly with 343 on the Halo stuff. Mm. Did you have to deal with both parties, or was it one particular party you dealt with more than the other? So, yeah, I mean, like, like you say, so 15 years of experience means I've got quite a lot of contacts in, in video game land, and um, uh, the guy that I uh, bumped into um, at a licensing fair um, from, from Namco um, is just someone I knew, and, and he's our point of contact. Um, so everything uh, conduits through him, which is great because, like, um, obviously, when you're working with Japanese uh, developers and publishers, there's the language um, translation um, hurdle that you need to kind of accommodate. Um, so having uh, having Shuhei looking after us um, and being able to do all the translation for us and working directly on the Japanese side of things is is superb. Excellent, excellent stuff. Um... Was there any particular pitfalls in, in taking the video game to the tabletop? For example, uh, I believe that you're working, it's uh, yourself, Matt Hart, and Richard Lomax. Or, or you're the cool. <laughs> Loxham. Loxham. I don't know why I said Lomax. Loxham. Call him Lomax. That'd be great. Uh, Lomax, because you're thinking of Don I'm thinking Diana. of Don and Diana. Yeah. Well done, Lloyd. But you guys have co created this game. Is there any particular pitfalls you've encountered going, looking at the video game and going, how do we transfer this into board game? Well, I think the biggest pitfall um, is to, to avoid is over-enthusiasm of trying to squeeze everything in. And I think one needs to always bear in mind that we are talking about two very different mediums. One is a, uh, you know, is a digital medium that's fully supported by you know, a hardcore computer kind of processing thousands of decisions uh, you know, for you every second. And the other one is um, pretty much just a piece of cardboard and some plastic and some yeah. dice. Right? So... So that's going to always that translation is always going to be incredibly difficult. So um, it, it's the the key to it is to find the things that denote the the Dark Souls experience, the Dark Souls feel, the Dark Souls what people what their expectations are from a session of Dark Souls, and making sure you capture that at at a high level. So it is that sense of danger, it is that sense that you can't just run in and, and flail, you know, button mash wildly or the equivalent in a board game, which is where two models meet and they and they stay locked together until one rolls more sixes than the other and, and then you move on and because quite frankly that's boring and yeah. there's a number of you know dungeon explorer style games that, that i've played that i just i've played once and i never need to play again because they are boring uh, so <laughs> so you know dark souls fans demand and expect um a, a high quality tactical combat experience so Making sure that the game is fluid, that people are moving around, that that's, you know positioning is important. These are all kind of core aspects of a video game that can translate. You know the, the fact that there are attack windows, that there are vulnerabilities after an enemy has attacked. So understanding how his behaviour is going to move and you being in the optimal position to take advantage of it. Again, these are all things that we can translate from a video game, but do actually work in a board game. Um, but things like you know um, people are talking about. I don't know, having NPCs to interact with, right? Why, why aren't you doing NPCs to interact with? Well, it, I just don't see how that would work in a, video, in a board game. Like maybe in a role-playing game, for sure. If you've got a great dungeon master or games master, go for your life. But I can't, I can't create via the medium of cardboard and, and, and plastic uh, a meaningful interaction with a non-player yeah. character. Mm -hmm. that, you know, that, that, just, that wouldn't translate. So mm -hmm. those are the things that we've kind of faded into the background in order to bring forward the core experience that we can, that we can make fun. No, the um, the core experience, Matt. Does the game? Does the enemies drive themselves, or does someone control them? Because at salute, you you guys were busy as heck, and I didn't get the chance to actually demo the game. How does that work? Does it does does the is there an AI element to it, or how, what? what yeah, it's, it's it's all AI driven. Um, the game is designed to be a cooperative experience. The like I say the 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 idea is is that it's a challenge to to take on the boss, and it's a tactical challenge. It's not just a you know a, a dice throwing challenge. Um, so there's an awful lot of 
pushback that we've had about, well, why are you using dice? That's not very Dark Soulsy. Well, actually, getting into the right position, deciding when to attack and when not to attack is Dark Soulsy. You still need an RNG, and believe it or not, in Dark Souls the video game, there's still an RNG going on, you know, in terms of criticals and stuff like that. So it's it's not a massive departure. Um, but yeah, the 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 essentially the the boss is is controlled by a number of AI cards, and this is one of the ways we've managed to build in a lot of replayability. If you take a boss, um, when you when you play against him, he has five randomly um, uh, generated um, uh, behavior cards. Yeah, and that's from a deck of ten. So every time you play, you shuffle the deck of ten and you deal the top five down. The other five go back in the box. Yeah. And, and you know, so they they're for a future game. So each time you play the dancer, the experience should be different. Um, obviously, if you play a, a million times, then you're probably going to see most of the combinations. But um, the idea then is you flip the top card and it tells you how the how the enemy moves, how he attacks, and where he's vulnerable. You do it again. You do it again. You do it again until you cycle through the five, and then. They, they don't get shuffled, they get put back up face face down, yep. and then you start again. And now now you and me and Warren and, and Justin, we're all now thinking, right, we know that the skewer attack is coming next, so like, let's make sure that we're not in front, or the guy with the aggro token who's the tank, let's stick him in front so he can take all the damage, and then all the dps style guys can kind of sneak around the back and kind of stab him in the back and get, <laughs> yeah, get extra yeah. damage. So you're actually working together, moving around the battlefield, um, which when we play it and when people play it for the first time is just electric it's it's just it's just next level in terms of you know just interaction rather than sitting there passively you know well I've, I've done my turn now i just need to sort of sit here for like five minutes while everyone else does their turn mm. you're actually constantly involved and in, in trying to help the other people you know what what abilities coming next where you should try and position so it's a much more engaging cooperative experience oh, I, I like the, this idea because you're oh you're gonna get that one moment that's going to make you go, oh crap, when the tank goes down and someone else needs to step up to the plate. Crap, Absolutely. The other thing dead. that's really cool, going Different back to what you were saying earlier about the lore, is one of the reasons why you want to explore the world before you find the boss mm -hmm. is if you find um, like, uh, the right kind of encounter, like a, gra like a gravestone, mm -hmm. you can actually interact with the gravestone on, the, on that particular encounter tile, and every gravestone you interact with allows you to pre-flip a boss behavior. Ah. So if you find the three or four gravestones around the world before you fight the boss, you've actually seen all of his behaviors up front mm. before you actually get to interact with him. So you can prepare, you can see, like maybe maybe he's just got ice attacks, so now you know you, that's the kind of armor that you should be going for. Whereas until you find the boss and discover this, you might be like, I don't know, pursuing armor that's, that's good against fire attacks. Mm. This sounds really interesting. Very so tactical. It's it's in my interest to go around and explore, yeah. Not so, just rush straight to the boss. So, right. So here's what we do. When yeah. We're sitting down to play. Warren's gonna go Leroy Jenkins. He'll go straight <laughs> for the boss. We'll go. Okay. Bye, Warren. Have fun. Okay. Let's go get the loot. I don't think that's gonna work, Justin. We'll, we'd lose our tank. It's not, it's not <laughs> yes, work. but well, we're off getting loot. We can build another tank. Yeah. <laughs> tank, well, tanks are to a penny. Anyone can tank. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see how it goes. No, the Kickstarter. Yeah. It's, there's only a few days left now. Yeah. It's, it's coming to a close, and it, my goodness, has it been successful. But yeah. if you guys have been thinking about the delivery of the Kickstarter, rec you know, recently there's been some <sighs> aggro about how Kickstarters and stuff have been delivered. I mean, what's your approach? Are you taking a, a different approach to other people to likes of retailers and things? Yeah, so um, in terms of the actual delivery date that we're putting down, uh, like you said, um, 15 years of... of Video game development at a senior level. I'm I'm pretty used to planning projects and and setting meaningful deadlines. So we've been working with Ludo Fact. They're our manufacturing partner. Um, Frank there has been involved in the project from day one and has been incredibly supportive. And um, we are supremely confident of hitting that date. Um, one of the things that we have tried to do that is a departure from the norm is is to is to introduce this concept of a retailer-friendly badge uh, for the Kickstarter. Um, up until this point, there's been a certain degree of friction between Kickstarter projects and and retailers. You yeah. know, um, essentially, every product sold at Kickstarter is is a product is a direct sale that that kind of cuts out the the retailer middleman, if you like. And and we don't feel that that is a sustainable um, approach to life. So we wanted to make sure that retailers who wanted to to get involved in the Kickstarter were able to do so. And we've actually um, 
put out some retailer exclusive add-ons. We got a lot of kickback. People wanted to buy them, but we stuck to our guns, and and it's for good reason that that it gives people an excuse or a reason to actually go into the local game store and and buy you know product from these guys, and it keeps them in business. Keeps the tables like that they have in their store open for people to go and play games. You can meet new friends. You can play your old friends. You can find new games, right? You know, like you know, and it's that kind of community focus that Steamforged has. We we just so firmly believe in 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 feeding into the gaming industry and the gaming community for it to sustain and grow and and still be there in five, ten, fifteen years time. And I hate the idea of 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 any departure from that 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 lends us towards a purely online experience. Um, it. it it, it terrifies me, quite frankly, as yeah. a gamer. I want a shop to go to and hang out with my mates and play games with and find new stuff. You know, and if if that shop owner can't stay open, then guess what? I don't have that anymore, and and that that'd be a sad day, I think, for everyone. Yeah, it's a it's a difficult balancing act because yes, you'll find loads of people online and stuff. Yeah, but it, it's having that that social real world hub. Yeah, that's what you're really wanting from that. Absolutely, and this can, is why board find... games, I think, are experiencing, and war games to a certain degree, but board games especially are experiencing such a such a surge in popularity, and not yeah. just within the core gaming community, but like you know, I went around a friend's house, and he's like, you know, he's not a war gamer or, or a role player or anything, but he had Settlers of Catan, he had Ticket to Ride, he had you know, uh, Carcassonne sitting on his shelf, and I'm like, hey, look at that, you've got some proper games. He said, well. To be fair, it's your fault," he said, "because you know we came around your house, we played Carcassonne, and we fell in love with it, and now we found all these amazing games. and mm. And what they like about it is it's an excuse for them as a family and friends to get together and actually interact as people, mm. um, rather than sitting there with your headphones on, talking, you know, facelessly to. They might be friends that you know in real life, but talking to a video screen is is very different from talking to people in real life. Mm. Yeah. Definitely. I do quite a lot of online gaming myself, and it is because right. you can struggle. Because even people you know that well, you've well, that you've whenever met, you and me are actually gaming online. But it, it gets a little annoying. No, but even people you know, right? And so they were sitting across the table from you. You'd have a, a hell of a good conversation and and, yeah, yeah. and crack and stuff while you're playing your game. It can yep. be a bit sterile when you're online because you can't you just you can't see them. Yeah. And the conversation's not anywhere near as as fun. And or entertaining as it is when you're actually there in real life. With well, them. I mean, like whenever you and me are playing the division on Xbox One, the number of times I've turned around and went, "Lloyd, did you just pick a fight?" And Lloyd just goes, <laughs> "Maybe," and then dead. Maybe. Well, look, sixty percent of at least sixty percent of communication um, is is nonverbal, mm. and the fact is, when you're talking into Skype, you're, you're missing out on sixty percent of how you're interacting with that person, uh, which is why I do think you know those those kind of interactions do leave people. Feeling like they want a bit more, and that's why I think board games are are increasing in popularity because it's it's people like spending time with people. Excellent, Matt. Have you yeah, something Matt, else? I'm loving the look of this game. I can't wait to actually get it on the table and give it a try. Yeah, I will come over to Ireland with a box at some point in time, and we'll play a game. Oh, absolutely! You just said that on camera. <laughs> you are now bound by verbal contract. No, Matt, I'm, I'm down with that. Matt, so, thank so you. Thank you very much for joining us, Matt. I'm, I'm going to leave it there because I want people to be sitting at home going. Yeah, I want more. I want to know more about that. Yeah. If you want to know more about that, get on over to the Kickstarter. There's just a few days left. Um, yeah. Congratulations. It's gone great guns. Mm. And I can't wait to see it actually in people's hands. It's going to be brilliant. In a world controlled by massive corporations, a steady aim and split-second decisions are needed for your Megacon to complete its goals. Begin your missions at the Mercs Hub on beastofwar.com. Enter into the dangerous dungeons of myth as a mighty hero and stand against the darkness. Visit the Myth Hub on beastofwar.com and begin your story. Dark Souls. Yeah. I, it's yeah. just like, what the heck? It, just it's, poof. It's, it's gone nuts. Well, hang on. Let me bring up the Kickstarter here. 2.6 million is all I can say here. No, you what? need to put your finger like that if you're going to do that. Fine, fine. I'll do the other one. 2.6 <laughs> Million. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's just it's just it's through crazy. the roof, and it's still got four days at the minute. By the time this goes out, it'll be less. It, it's going to be ending on Monday, isn't it? Uh yeah, yeah, I believe so. Let me call it up here. Yeah, it's yep. Monday. Yeah, so it'll be over on Monday. If you haven't jumped in on it, you're thinking about it. That <sighs> it's such a lovely looking game, though, as well, isn't it? It really is. I mean. 
I wasn't I wasn't entirely taken when when I first came out. Mm -hmm. Then I started seeing the minis and stuff, and I was like, oh okay, this is this is probably something I haven't really taken into account. And then Tom was at my place there uh, at the weekend past, yeah. and he was playing Dark Souls because he's already been through it all before. So he was taking me through it, doing a bit of a a watch and play type aye, session aye. and he was attacking <laughs> monsters and I was like these monsters are really cool yeah, yeah. I can see now why the minis and all look really cool for yeah, this well Tom actually gave me a copy of Dark Souls 1 and didn't help me or anything just said here you go Justin give that a go so I sit down load it up start playing yeah this is kind of fun it's, it's a little difficult to kill these skeletons but yeah what the hell meet the first boss oh dear god why what <laughs> did you get killed off he, did you get Many killed times. off by this, this very this very bare dog thing. I, uh, no, it was, it was ginormous like, on top no, no, of the no, tower. You were probably playing three. I was playing one. No, I think it was Dark Souls one. Uh, I, right. I, I killed the, the first asylum? one. But yeah, I killed the yeah. first one and then got killed by the big bull up on the tower. I think that's probably what you're talking about. That's boys. it. It's a, yeah. it's a bull, isn't it? Yeah, I couldn't no, get past that. So. Okay, no, no, no. <laughs> I, I can't kill the first one that's in the asylum. You have to drop down on top of it with your sword out. Yeah, I, yeah, like, I did that. Did that. I just... <laughs> I, for some reason, I couldn't quick roll. I <laughs> cannot quick roll. You can't even get out of the first part. Yeah. You know what? You I, know what it is. Yeah. Just you've got to follow the rules of Dark Souls, and it's the words "get good," and that's the only way you do it. So. <laughs> no, but like I, I even went to the bother of watching a guy do a bit of a playthrough, and I yeah. thought, right, there has to be something I'm not doing here. Let's watch a let's play, and see what I'm doing. No, he's doing the exact same stuff as I'm doing. He's just getting out the way quicker than I am. Yeah, so I, I, think, words, I think it's reaction times more than anything. In other words, he's doing the exact same stuff as you, but better. <laughs> uh, but quicker. <laughs> then the board game's for you. Yes. Slower paced, you can roll the dice, and if you get stuck, you can just fudge it. Uh, Turn the dice over. No. Look at that! Success! Nah, don't, you don't do that. You don't do that. No cheat but, codes in board games, Lloyd. Uh, <laughs> well, no, no, hang on, hang on, Lloyd. Or Ben, there is a cheat code. It's called Lloyd fudging dice, twisting, well, going. No, 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 that didn't land like that. It landed like that. True. I don't fudge yes. dice. You just said you sick. would. No, I said you could if you got stuck. I don't fudge dice. You can't even get out of the first room in Dark Souls. It's, it's, you need all the not, help it's you not, can get. Not the first room. <laughs> it's it's the first area. And it, it's because that goddamn thing just keeps smashing me with a gigantic hammer. I keep. You dying. haven't even got to the bull thing we were talking about. No, no, Wait no. till you get there. You'll enjoy that. Right. If I get there, I, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm stuck. I'm going to move us on because we have stuff to talk about. <laughs> All right. I'm just going to say, Matt Hart and Richard uh, Loxham have done an amazing job. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. On that yeah. stuff. Absolutely crazy good. Right. Board games and adventuring. Yeah. It seems coincidental, but Warhammer uh, Quest, Quest Silver Tower. What? Quest Silver Tower? Yeah, Warhammer Quest the Silver Tower. Uh, the Silver Tower actually is an old creation from sort of Warhammer and Warhammer 40,000 past, which is like a Zenshin creation where it's an ever-changing labyrinth. I would now, just, like, I would just sounds... like to point out that I didn't murder that. The word the isn't in there, and that's what threw me, Ben. <laughs> that's all right, but anyway. <laughs> Warhammer Quest, Silver Tower, first look. Yeah. So yes, this is the uh, fantastic new board game that is looking insane and is taking everybody by storm on social media and all over the place. People are loving this from Games Workshop. And it should be out in, uh, well, two weeks' time now. Or a week's time, actually, from the time this goes out. Yeah, so, and, yeah. Right, not too ben, far away. Do we, do we have anything online about this at the minute? Any images or anything? Yes. So there has been some really cool stuff that Games Workshop put out themselves. And they uh, had seen that people were looking at a few leaks and things like that. But they turned their attention to showing off some of the heroes that you'll be getting inside the set. Ooh, now, nice. just like in the old one, you have some very different, uh, really cool and interesting heroes and stuff. Uh, the Barbarian is back in the shape of the Dark Oath Chieftain. But they also have some other really cool characters, like there's a Stormcast Eternal with the Night Questor. Uh -huh. There's a Fire Slayer Doomseeker, which is like the Slayer from the old game. Mm -hmm. We also have the Excelsior War Priest with his Griffin Hound, which is pretty awesome. Sort of the Warrior Priest that's sort of backing everyone up and giving them buffs and things. Yeah. And he's got a really cool little cute pet. Then you also have the Mistweaver Scythe and the Tenebran Shard, who are the uh, the first look really at the new elves or the elves for the Age mm -hmm. of Sigma. So we have a spell cast and then we have almost like an assassin type. Yeah. And it's quite interesting because they've also brought in a lot more of the dark elven features that would have happened through the uh, the sort of end times and the start of the Age of Sigma. So it gives you a really interesting look at the aesthetic for yeah. what they're going to be like in the game. I was so, going to say they don't look like elves to me. They look very dark. 
Please. They are dark elves, yeah, yeah. yeah. Are they, are, they, are, they, are the elves all one thing then? The elves? Yes. Yes, the elves are all under one mantle now. They're all under the same title, yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's looking really cool, really cool mm. the adventures. I do notice, though, Ben, uh, there's, there's a... We, we touched... We, we had a little chat about this during the week when we were seeing these images. Mm-hmm. And uh, one of the things that we kind of noticed is there's no female character in the lead, in the actual well, adventure models by the looks well, of it. Hang on, hang on. Hang on. But, the, the Mistweaver could be female? I, I, I look at it and think it could be female. Mm. Possibly. Well, it's, it's been interesting because a lot of people have been debating that because the Mistweaver is potentially go, is a female character, yep. but everyone's not really sure because it could be anything. Because it's, it's an elf, mm. so it could be a woman or it could be a man. But there's no like overtly female characters, you see. Yeah. Mm. But, yeah. yeah. The reason I bring it up is because during the when it was the card game, mm. there was a couple of really cool looking female characters in there, Ben. Yeah, so the Warhammer Quest uh, card game that came out from Fantasy Flight Games, they really went the whole hog when it came to sort of the, the genders and stuff. So they had a Bright Wizard who was a female, and the Way Watcher in there as well is a female character. Mm. So it would be really interesting to see what they do with this because I think Warhammer Quest could be one of those things where they can explore single female characters in the, the blisters and stuff like that and sort of bringing them into the game and potentially as enemies as well, which is quite cool. Yeah, mm. yeah. I'll be looking Very forward cool. to getting some more of those characters and stuff that... I know they're not going to come directly from mm. the Warhammer Quest card game and stuff like mm. that because the yeah, universe yeah. has changed and stuff like uh, that. You, you'll hope for some of the inspirations yes. to be carried over. Inspiration is exactly the word I'm looking for there. But we've been seeing other images and stuff coming out on the, on the, on the internet. Like you said, this was kind of a response to a lot of leaks happening. Yeah, so uh, over sort of the weekend, last uh, over Saturday and Sunday, a whole bunch of stuff appeared on the internet. There was the cool teaser trailer, which was sort of setting everyone on fire, and then eventually all the leaks started to come out from the White Dwarf and stuff. And it's showing off a really p- absolutely jam-packed board game. Well, we're uh, just looking, it comes at, with, we're just looking at the box set, the big wide yes. picture at the minute. It mm. is jam-packed. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it is yeah. Warm Request Silver Tower. There's no duh in there. <laughs> well, it is the Silver Tower, effectively. <laughs> I, need, I need to say it more like Captain Kirk. Warhammer Quest. The Silver, Silver Tower. Tower. No, there's no <laughs> that. It's just Warhammer Quest. Silver Tower. <laughs> Am I butchering this? this yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you can't do Kirk. I'm, I'm very sorry, but you cannot do Kirk. Yeah, but this, this looks awesome. Yes, it does. Yeah. One thing I noticed, though, is it doesn't seem to have any doors to hold the tiles together. No, it's not as old school as the original one. There have been some other pictures that came out showing off how the tiles go together. Mm. It looks like it's just sort of square reversible ones that you put down for the tabletop. So it's no linking like with the um, hex stuff that you've got in Betrayal Cal. But yeah. mm. I sort of guess that's pretty old school and very awesome. It sort of fits into the style of exactly what one Quest was like in the original and things. But no, there are no doors. <laughs> See, I'm going to be a bit born at this stage because all the leaks and stuff have mostly been about the miniatures. Yeah. Which is really nice to see you want, you a really cool set of miniatures and stuff. Mm. But I want to see what the tiles look like up close. I want to see how they connect. I'm a little bit unsure if they're just butting up against each other because you know, they tend to move around. One of the things I liked about the doors, as much as it kind of limited your, your imagination because you were constantly going through a door to each, each yeah. part of the table, was that they were actually used to hold the board together. Mm. So nothing slipped about. Mm-hmm. So I'm kind of missing it from that point of view. Well if, it, well, if it works in almost the same sense as how um, Warhammer Quest was, they'll have it so you just basically will start on the one tile and when you get to new areas, you'll flip over an encounter card, which I think is how they're working through some of the mechanics for this. And that will de- it sort of describe exactly what's on the next tile and stuff like that. And because it's the Zentian Tower, the Silver Tower, all the rooms will be ever-changing and things like that. It's like a, a labyrinth almost. Yep. So I guess that plays into that and the random feel to things. Well, let's, let's move on and talk about some enemies. Like, there's the Skaven horrors, giant summoner, and things like this in, in, yeah. in the box, Ben. Yeah, so, yeah, it's all, all sort it's of... It's all coming in the box. Yes, all of this sort of stuff comes in the box. I think in total there's about sort of 42 models. Like, here, in, in, we're yeah, looking at the so. giant summoner at the minute. That's cool looking. Uh, it's the, the gaunt summoner. summoner Sorry, just so, you know, gaunt be. summoner. <laughs> I am butchering again. <laughs> uh, but, but, yeah, there's some, some really cool Zen stuff in here. In yeah. there as well. You've even got this little moon dude here holding a Stormcast Eternal's mask. Uh, yes. ripped cool. off, which is quite yeah. cool. My but favorite, um, I think, has got to be the uh, the Ogroid Thaumaturge. Thank goodness it's like you said this that. massive, huge beast. <laughs> yeah, this so. is awesome looking. Just stay there. Yeah. We're looking at now, Ben. It is fabulous looking. So awesome. Yeah, the, yeah. the sculpt you is see beautiful it? on that with the the flames coming out of, coming up out of the ram skull. Very yeah. cool. 
I mean, it, it's it's really interesting because this is almost giving you a look exactly as to how they want to try and theme stuff with the rest of Age of Sigmar. Mm. Because if you scroll down certainly for, below the Ogroid, you see the grots. Yeah, I was just they're like these four-legged, two-armed goblins, which is really weird. That is but, weird. Yeah. They look amazing. They look almost like spiders. Mm. Yes, yeah. yeah. I don't like they've got a... like a web thing going on, so like a yeah. spider grot. Mm. You don't like a grot. Spider grot does whatever a spider grot can. Can he swing? From a web. No, he's not. He's a grot. Look out. There falls spider grot. Oh, dear. <laughs> oh, my God. Sorry, I couldn't resist. I couldn't if resist. You, if you look a little bit further down that page as well, you'll see some of the really interesting, um, like, core Zenchian creatures they've got, because they've got the Zangors, which are almost a little bit like their take on new beastmen, because they're bird-themed beastmen, effectively, to sort of fit into that, uh, that uh, wheelhouse of chaos. So yeah, it looks really cool. I'm re I'm really interested to see how they sort of use these models in further adventures and things like that. And obviously, it'll be fantastic to actually paint these up because you'll have so many different types of miniatures to paint that you probably won't get too bored with trying to get it all ready and stuff for the tabletop. So the minis, the minis, just 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 are excellent. I really like I really like these. Uh, what did you call them again? The the Tanzor Tan Tanzanorgs. Tanzanorgs. Which one? Sorry. Oh right, the, those guys. The birdie yeah. beast man. The 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 Zangors. <laughs> the Zangors. The Zan the Zan Zangors, yes. Right. I like yeah. the Skiven Death Runner that's down the bottom as well here. He looks quite cool. Yeah, it's like a new cool assassin type miniature for, mm. for those guys, yeah. Anything so, else? Yeah. Uh, I think nope, that's it. Oh let's go back up just slowly just to make sure we haven't missed anything. Oh we've got some of the Oh what's the little fire things? Pasties. Brimstone horrors, they're that's cool. That's new. Mm. Oh, that's new. Pink horrors, blue horrors, brimstone horrors. Cool. Where are they, mm. Ben? The little tiny uh, horror things. Oh, they're just basically building on the... You know how normally with the Zench, they had the pink horrors and the blue horrors? Yeah, I know about the pink ones, but I don't think I've seen the brimstone ones before. Oh, no, they're, they're, they're totally new. So they're basically building on that to give you some extra bits and pieces for Zench and sort of adding cool. to it, embellishing on things. Yeah, Very so, cool. Yeah, I think it'd be really interesting to see how this game works. I think it's going to be a fantastic sort of... Maybe even an entry point for people to get into Age of Sigmar and sort of push people ahead. Because I think the idea of playing as single heroes and leveling up and doing the whole dungeon crawling thing is very, yeah. very famous now. Everybody's really getting into that sort of thing. And so having that to boost you and boost Age of Sigmar would be a really good idea to sort of building collections and stuff. Well, they're, well, well, they're bringing it out at just the right time because I mean, if, you look at, yeah. if you look at the box set, it's just jam-packed. Mm -hmm. and, and if you look at the, the success of Dark Souls... People are ready to lap this up. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's scratching at that dungeon crawling itch. It's going to have that really cool role play feel to it. Mm. The fact that it's going to come with the whole sort of questing and adventures means that people are like narrative are going to get into this. One of the things that people haven't really fallen in love with too much with Age of Sigma is the narrative. So it'll be really interesting to have more personal stories from these heroes and stuff as they sort of fight their way through this tower and things. Yeah, it should be really cool. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I will probably spend for this. So yeah. <laughs> what you were saying about game tiles there. Look here. Yes. You see in the center of this image, you can sort of see a board layout there, and I'm not seeing doors. I'm sorry to say. No, no. I've seen uh, I've seen some other pictures that we haven't looked at mm. here. Yeah. With, and the, there's no doors holding okay. the, holding the tiles together. Okay. I do want to okay. see no. some of the tiles and stuff because the artwork mm. and stuff in in the original game was really nice on the yeah. tiles. Yeah. I think. You know, they've knocked it out of the park with the minis. Mm -hmm. I just want to see what the artwork's like. All right, well, here, here's a question for you. Something like this, would it be something that would tempt you to actually take that next step up? Because it's like Ben was saying, this might be the gateway game for Age of Sigmar. Would this draw you further into maybe picking up a force? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> hey, family show. <laughs> because I was, I was actually going off looking... Mm. to the Games Workshop website saying it's having a little scour around going, I wonder if there's anything more about this board game on there. Mm. And, then I, and then I just, I landed in the, in the Age of Sigmar uh, section it? of the site. Yeah, I was just having a wee browse. Mm. And immediately, because Age of Sigmar's kind of been washing over me, mm -hmm. I think the likes of this Warhammer Quest, um, the Silver Tower is going to stop Age mm. of Sigmar washing over me. But if you go to the top of this page, Justin, yep. I spied the army I wanted. And, I, and it never really occurred to me just I think the army is a great value. Hmm. See that star collecting skeleton horde. Uh, boop, this. Boom! That's my army. Actually, Bam! That's... There it is. Oh yeah, take that. Boof. I quite like that. Uh, I was that's... looking at this, going, "Oh, this is the army for me." <laughs> right, well, here, bring, bring it up. Let's, let's ben, get a closer look at some of these. Is this? I believe you think this is the latest army or something that's come out because I hadn't seen this before, and I was just looking at it going, 
Oh, where have you been? Yeah, so the Skeleton Horde was one that was added. It was uh, maybe a sort of a, about a month ago now, yeah. but we, we've talked about the um, Star Collecting stuff on a previous weekender, and everyone was really enjoying it, and we thought this was a fantastic gateway. But yeah, I think they'd noticed that people really wanted just skeletons and awesome stuff like that, so they've gone the whole hog and put the Skeleton Horde together, which is led by their version of Ark and the Black on that really awesome mount and stuff. Yeah, The mount awesome. really is cool. I know it's got. I know it's covered in skulls. Can we go to the still image because I think it's bigger? Yeah, not a problem. Uh, actually, here it is. There you go. Well, maybe it's not. That's the 360 again. No, click this. Uh, one second. There uh, you go. And now click <laughs> there. There we go. Oh. We, no, zoom in. Yeah. There you go. Okay. Now I know he's jam packed full of skulls, but the skulls are there for a reason. Yeah. Well, I mean, like, you can see these weird little soul things down the bottom gathering up the souls of the fallen. Because he's what? He's powered by the undead or something, Ben, isn't he? Yeah, so these constructs were sort of brought to life by the, the intense magics of the end times, mm. and so it's fueled by the dead souls and stuff that exist within it, and they keep it walking and moving around and things. It's a little bit like how they sort of sometimes fluff the way that the undead work, where it's actually a spirit animating the skeleton, yeah. rather than it just being sort of come back to life kind of thing. Let's so. have a look at the, um, the um, mounted guys there. The unit? Yeah. Okay, here you go. That's just cool. I, I mean, and I'm looking at this going 50 quid. I'm thinking that's his bargain, 50 quid. Yeah, maybe. For the amount of stuff that you're going to get. Because well, essentially, you just whip this out and start playing. That's mm. the key thing. Pretty much. I mean, the rules are free. You can download all the other War Scrolls from the apps and things like that. So you just basically pick this up and you can play Age of Sigma pretty much straight off the bat, really, once you stuck it all together. Mm. Yeah. So. And I love skeletons. There actually looks to be a reasonable amount of variation in the skeleton. You know the way you used to get, you know, your box of skeletons and they all look pretty similar. Yeah, well, it's it's not it's, it's not. Nice, I like what I'm seeing here. It's it's not the hero quest skeletons and every last one of them the same. Yeah, the stand, yeah standing got, up in the same pose got all the quite time. Quite a few yeah. different <laughs> bits of you know different armor, different helmets, different shields. Yeah. Let's go for the three sixties there, Justin. All right, so this is I think one of our leaders. It's really cool, and the thing I like about this is I'm looking at going. I could be really lazy with this paint job. I just basically, much. basically do dry brushing and washing, and I'll have a force up and go. Uh, yeah. Lloyd, I am going to do that. Tiss, tiss. Shouldn't be doing that. <laughs> Why? Says the right. guy who doesn't base his minis. There's a difference. I at least put the work into painting it. Oh, I'll put work into it. I'm not going to be as simple as dry brushed, washed. There'll be work. Well, like, the skeletons look reasonably easy to paint. Don't yeah, it? be dry brushed and washed. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> That's, but, uh, that's I mean, actually that, got zero wash on it. Yeah, I mean, the reason that we, I mean, I think that we talked about this as as a whole is that it's it's kind of going back to that old style of how people viewed Warhammer Quest, where that people had come that had come from role playing and they played Dungeons and Dragons and things like that. They picked up Warhammer Quest, they did a bit of role playing, they played with their heroes, mm -hmm. and then they realised that there was more of a miniatures line out there, and so they took, for example, their Slayer or their Barbarian, and then they picked up maybe a box of um, sort of the Marauders of Chaos, or they picked up a box of Dwarves, and they mm -hmm. put it together and they started playing the tabletop game, and I reckon that's probably what they're trying to, they're going to try and do with this because they've already got said that they're going to make the rules for the heroes and all the monsters <laughs> available as um age of sigma war scrolls yeah so i reckon at some point maybe we'll start seeing a lot more crossover and we'll have like the heroes from one going into the game and from age of sigma into potentially warhammer quest so you could add orcs and you could add the uruks and stuff into there to fight in the the, the labyrinths of zen yeah. and stuff yeah. It'll, it'll take a little while, Ben, to get the Uruks and the Aeolfs names. And yeah. the Aeolfs and the Duardins yeah. and stuff, yeah. <laughs> but I'm, I'm liking it, and yeah. I am going to get that army. Well, you'll, you'll that, need that's someone to play against. That's my Age of Sigma army. You'll, you'll need someone to play against. So. Do you guys have favourites? Because I wasn't in your discussion in one of the other weekenders. Well, I, I do have a favourite. Uh, me, everybody knows, I love my chaos. Get me some chaos gods on the go and I'm happy. So, what I would go for is actually this, which is... Slaves to Darkness, which is real nice. You get some cool chariots, some great Chaos Cavalry, and the Chaos Knights, which are just so cool. That, and you then also get the little sorcerer guy at the front, who I think just looks badass. Nice. Super looking. You know, it's, it's one of those model kits that has never lost its charm. You know, and that big chariot at the back with a war guy on it. Nice. I like yeah, the fact nice. that all the kits come with a, a big central character and stuff. Mm. They're a complete... Feel yeah. that army yeah. and feel like, oh, my epic guy is going in here. What are mm. you going to do with your epic guy? Yeah, I, I mean, it's, that, it's that whole moment of, you know, the heroic moments. The heroes are going to step out from the front of the lines and go, 
Aha! I challenge you to a duel. Exactly. Yeah. Ben. I mean, where, yes. Do you have a favorite? Yeah, I think I would go to, for the Slaves of Darkness as well. I really like the look of them. The Chaos Warriors have always had this just endlessly perfect aesthetic for the Warhammer world, and I love their armor with the closed helms and the big you know, like fur and stuff going on and stuff. Mm. But the way I'd sort of view this is I'd take the Slaves of Darkness and then I'd try and tie it almost into what's coming with the Warhammer quest. Yeah. So I'd try and get that Zenshian look to them, and I'd do their armor with almost like a hint of blue and stuff, mm. and add some of the monsters and things into there as well. So you basically have this growing collection almost straight away, really. Yeah. Oh, I like it. I like the idea of it. And, as always, eventually, everyone falls to chaos. They do. <laughs> no, everyone eventually becomes dead. And then I get to... No, no, no. The undead! Grandpapa Nurgle is going to take care of you. You know, mm. you, you'll never die. You never have to worry about... Do you know who's shelter. here in the studio if you were watching the vlog? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Rama is over here doing some painting tutorials mm -hmm. and stuff. I'm going to have to pick his ear when we get out of here. Pick his ear? Pick his ear. Ah, pick Roman, it. what secrets do you hold? Aha! <laughs> uh -huh. I don't think that's the right expression. Pick, his, pick his brain. Pick his brain! <laughs> there we go. <laughs> pick his ear. Yeah. I'm going to have to pick his brain about ideas for painting the skeletons and stuff. I'm going to have to get the images up and say, what, what, what wash and dry brushing techniques can you... <laughs> Are you trying to give him a conniption? He will be left in the corner having a seizure, just going, no, 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 get away, get away, no, 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 no. We are going to have Rama on the show tomorrow, so if you're yeah. interested to see, uh, I think we're going to have some minis and stuff that he's been painting mm -hmm. to, to give you an idea of the upcoming tutorials and stuff. So if you're interested in that, come on over to the backstage show tomorrow. Right, uh, I'm going to move us on because we've run out of time. Okay. I'm going to take a quick break and then we're going to be back to talk about uh, Plague Inc., the board game Kickstarter. Ooh. Fight for the Iron Kingdoms as a Warcaster. Take control of the mighty Jax, arcane devices, and dark sorceries to bring the fight to the War Machine Hub on beastsofwar.com. Keep your blaster handy, the West is a dangerous place. Fight to survive as men turn to monsters and the dead rise on the Wild West Exodus Hub at beastsofwar.com. We have time just to squeeze in one Kickstarter this week. And it's a creepy one. I think it's a creepy one because I'm a bit of a hypochondriac and you guys have picked something about plague and disease and all sorts <laughs> of... and diarrhea and Let, vomiting and all stop. sorts of weird Let stuff. Let me take the lead on this. Okay. Tell us all about Dustin. Many people out there will have played the video game Plague Inc. Now this is a fantastic game where you're actually playing the disease and you're trying to infect all of humanity and eventually kill off every single living person in the world. With diarrhea no. and vomit. That's one of the symptoms. You see, the key is you have to be clever and tactical with how you evolve your plague. So, yes, I could start giving people diarrhea, vomiting, you know, brain embolisms, comas, paralysis. Yeah. But if I do too much too quickly, it's going to start to become really scary and people are going to notice my plague. Okay. So I don't want that to happen. That's cool. I've never played this before. It's based on a, on a video game. Yes. Yeah. It even says in the Kickstarter. Now, I had a brief chat with these guys. The, the key, the point that Justin just raised is, and I thought it was genius, is that you're supposed to have a virus, yes. but don't get too good at killing people too immediately. Quickly. You have to otherwise, be able to spread. Otherwise, the world wants to kill your virus dead. Yeah, otherwise the world becomes focused on creating a cure for you. Whereas if, you know, if you're just you know, a harmless little sneeze that's just slowly infecting everybody, <laughs> and then all of a sudden you've got uh, an evolution that goes, by the way, total organ failure. Bye-bye. Yeah, yeah. Ben, where are you on this? Yeah, I'm loving this. I think it's a really fantastic uh, idea for a board game. It's effectively like you're playing Pandemic from the other side of the, the conflict, effectively. Yeah. Um, and I think the way that they've, they've changed it to go from sort of the video game to the tabletop game is fantastic. It's the same designer as well that's been working on it and you take your little disease and you add little um, sort of option cards to it which will make it more virulent in hot places so that's where you want to try and focus your attention and your infection rates and yeah. stuff and your diarrhea and your diarrhea <laughs> obviously more diarrhea everywhere for you there Lloyd I guess but uh, <laughs> but yeah and then sort of working on that and sort of changing your disease as it mutates and sort of adding in new things to it and trying to avoid the ire of the other players so they're not just sort of like nuking you or using like crazy event cards to stop you from doing things and stuff yeah, yeah. well when you say nuking you there's mm. point there, there's there's cities and stuff in this because I've watched the video yeah. and yes. I thought it was really interesting when they said 
uh, that other players can launch airstrikes against your cities, cities that you've infected to try and wipe you out. Yeah, well, you see, yes. the, the video game itself is a single-player game, so it's, it's you versus the world. In this, you and your mates are going to sit down at a table together, and each of you will have your own plague that you're trying to kill the world with. Which, yeah. you know, you can't just let your mate go into, you know, Central America and spread all the way through there and then kill that, because they're going to get the points for it. Yes. So, tactical airstrike, and that'll do, yeah. Blow up, blow up a couple of cities. Oh, you, I'm, I'm sorry, you're infected people. I'm sorry. It does sound, it sounds, it sounds like a lot of fun. And the guy in the video, James, says they've spent ages, he says he's working on it for two years. Yeah. He says they've done loads and loads and loads of play testing. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping that is the case, because if this is a really tight rule set mm -hmm. that just works, it's, it sounds like an awesome night in. You see, well, it's not even a night in. This is one that I would bring along with us whenever we're doing the salute run. Because it just imagine you, me, Warren, and say Lance sitting on the boat with this laid out. No, all just no, having a laugh. Gonna, and a it's not going to work with Lance because the first moment we mention vomiting or diarrhea, he'll be away off with his boat sickness, going, "No, I can't play this <laughs> game anymore." How about brain embolisms? Is that fine? Uh, no, because then I'll be having a paranoid attack with my hypochondria kicking in, thinking <laughs> I'm going to die of a brain embolism. Um, <laughs> okay, how about nosebleeds? Do you okay with those, or do you not like the sight of blood? Let's just not play it on a boat, okay? <laughs> Let's not play it on a boat. This, I, I'm going to have to get loaded a copy of this for Christmas. Because yeah. this is the perfect game for you. You think? Because you're a hypochondriac. Let's get you over those fears. Let's expose you to those fears. Let's be the virus. Be the virus, yes. Be the disease. <laughs> disease. The, one, the one thing that I think is really, like, one of the really cool elements to this is that when it actually gets to the stage where you've infected a lot of people, you then roll the death dice. And I love that sort of almost um, that feel of being like, now I get to find out how many people die. And then you roll the dice and you're like, ha, 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 and you add all your lethality to it and stuff. I love that sort of that awesome feel to that little section at the end of the game at the turn where you're rolling that dice and killing loads of people. Sounds great. Mm. <laughs> Maybe I'm getting too into this. I think, um, you, I think you are getting a little bit too into it. Am I like, getting a bit too mad? You're like a wicked dictator going to release pathogens on the world. No, yeah, no, okay. no, no. L look at this face. Look at this face. That, that's, that's quite clearly a mad scientist just waiting <laughs> to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. There you go. Yeah. What can you say? I, I really like it. Yeah. It's, it's I think it's one of those fantastic. Cool games. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, it's one of those ones. It's, it's going to land. People are going to go nuts for it. It's already funded. So this is a sure thing if you're wanting to drop in on this one. Can we see some of the cards and stuff? Uh, yeah, I think there, there are some of them on the, the page here. If I scroll back up again. Because they're onto their stretch goals then, so they're yeah. funded already then. Yeah, and they're already punching through stretch goals. So, let's see. Du, 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 du. There's oh, some of the cards. So these are some of the ones you can play against your opponents or play on yourself. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah, because in the, in the video, go and watch the video. It's awesome. Yeah. But there's the, they talk about having the Olympics. Yeah. And I can see the card there where you, have, you can hold events in mm -hmm. countries that, that drive infected people to countries that aren't yet infected because, like, Thousands of people are going to go and see the Olympics. Exactly, exactly. The same kind of thing happens in the game where you'll have world events like this. Uh, they actually have a, a zombie plague in the video game, which is quite a lot of fun. So you actually can make a zombie virus and then have a zombie apocalypse run through Plague Inc., which is a lot of fun. <laughs> like, a, like a World War Z type yeah, thing. But yeah, but instead of trying to stop it, you're now playing the zombies. You're trying to kill the world, trying to eat the delicious brains. Brains! brains. One of the other yeah. like key things of this I think is quite interesting, and it might it'll look appeal to people is there's almost like an area control element to stuff where you play down countries and you try and infect cities within there but if you have the most there you'll get extra points and stuff like that and it's all about sort of moving around where your infected markers are and stuff and mm. taking control of important places so that they'll benefit your disease rather than other people's and then also moving your disease into places so that you can stop people getting a dominance and so that's where you get that awesome sort of style of card play where you're sort of screwing people over and playing events and things yeah really cool I like it. This is definitely one that I want to jump in on. I'm sold. I'm sold. When, when is it out? When can we get uh, our hands on this? It, I, the, the Kickstarter ends uh, on the 31st of this month. So there's a bit of time to jump in on it yet. Uh, delivery date, I'm not sure. I haven't read that far into the Kickstarter yet. But you can go check out the Kickstarter page and find out for yourself. Awesome. Right. And with that, I'm going to wrap the show. Okay. Before I think any more about diarrhea and vomiting and all these nasty things. <laughs> why, is it, why is it those two, though, that you seem to focus on? Because they're horrible, especially if they happen at the same... Never Just mind. It. Never mind. Let's wrap the show before it gets silly. <laughs> See you tomorrow on the XLBS. Until then, have a great weekend. Hey, Greg.
universe comes to a world of magic as science and the arcane combine to make marvels. Meet steampunk inventors and orc mystics at the Volsung Hub on beastsofwar.com. From Viking halls to the cities of the future, terrain buffs will love our foreground hub. Watch gaming tables of all genres come to life at beastsofwar.com. Uh, 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 uh,